Good evening. It is 7.30, just past. Uh, welcome. We have a slightly larger in-person um, attendance than we thought we might have. Um, we have two brilliant talks ahead of us, uh, and it's good to see that people will venture out in spite of Omicron and it being still winter. Um, but I'm sure we have a large online audience as well. So this evening we have two talks where if I had to find a common thread, it would be that in different ways we can manage what we do with photons and what we do with plants more intelligently than we have in the past. And that in many ways, science does have the capacity to um, produce better solutions, which we obviously need quite urgently. So this evening we start with a student speaker who is online. Uh, it's Tiernan Doherty, who um, will pick up on things that uh, uh, your supervisor was talking about um, at the previous outing of this of the CSAR um, lectures, uh, Sam Stranks. And you're gonna talk about nanostructures and how they make lead halide perovskites manageable for uh, making better solar cells. So thank you very much for agreeing to give us a talk. Thanks very much for the introduction, Richard. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Tiernan Doherty, um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about nanoscale structure and halide perovskites and what it can mean for performance and stability. So first off, what is a perovskite? Well, halide perovskites are an emerging class of semiconductors that have been developed over the last 10 or 15 years, and you might have seen my supervisor, Sam, speaking a bit more in detail about them a few weeks ago. Um, people are really excited about them because they're very easy to make. They're defect tolerant. You can make them in these inks and deposit them on substrates. And with a little bit of heat, they'll self-assemble into these nice polycrystalline high-performing films. Um, they're also very easy to kind of modify and tune so we can tailor them for different applications, probably most famously high-performing um, lightweight photovoltaics, but also things like high-performing x-ray detectors, medical imaging, um, LEDs, and also um, maybe someday building integrated PV. But in spite of all kind of the remarkable progress that we've had in empirical device improvements, there's still a lot of fundamental science that we don't fully understand about perovskites and you know how we can improve them and where things like performance losses come from. And in fact, understanding performance losses has really been a big challenge over the last few years in perovskites. So when we look at the optoelectronic material or properties of a well-optimized material, we might expect it to be pretty homogeneous. But in perovskites, if we look at the emission from a high performing film, which is really a proxy for local performance, we see very, very big variations in how well this material is performing. So some grains are very bright, operating close to our theoretical limits and other grains are very dark. And in these dark grains, we're losing a lot of efficiency because of what, what are called trap states in the band gaps so these energy levels that let charge carriers recombine without ever really contributing to how well our device is gonna work. Now, understanding where, where these trap states come from was the focus of um, my early PhD work. I really wanted to understand what the structural landscape was around these trap states. And the key thing that we found is that where these traps form, they tend to form in clusters. And um, these clusters tend to be associated with kind of unexpected phase impurity. So nanoscale structural variations that we don't expect to be present. And specifically hexagonal phase impurities, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Now, this was surprising because we can't see these hexagonal phase impurities with many of the macro scale techniques that we use to um, characterize these materials, but we could see them with some of our nano probes of structure. The question that kind of immediately was raised was where do these hexagonal um, phase impurities come from in this state of the art perovskite composition, which I've, I've written the formula of down here on the bottom of the screen. And we decided that to answer this really had to go back and look at the structures that this complex perovskite was based on. And it was based on a much simpler perovskite, form amidinium lead iodide, or what people colloquially will call um, FAPI. And FAPI is really a simple cubic perovskite structure. In the center, in the A site, you have form amidinium. In the B site, you'll have some lead, and then surrounding the lead in forming these octahedral cages, as we call them, um, is the halide, which is iodide. And FAPI is really an ideal perovskite for photovoltaics. It has a nice band gap and is very thermally stable, but people moved away from it in the field because it has a critical flaw. 
And that's that it's very thermodynamically unstable at room temperature. So it will very quickly transition from the nice cubic perovskite structure that we want into this undesirable photo inactive hexagonal perovskite. And this is the exact same hexagonal perovskite that we see in state-of-the-art compositions contributes to um, performance losses. Now, the difference here is that in FAPI, the entire film very quickly converts into these hexagonal phases, whereas in the more state-of-the-art compositions, um, it's only very local regions. And these state-of-the-art compositions, they kind of, they arose because people realized that if you added in things like cesium and methyl ammonium to the form amodinium, mixed it together, included it in the perovskite structure, you could stabilize a material, at least macroscopically, that was very similar to FAPI. It had very similar ideal properties for photovoltaics, um, but it didn't seem to transition to these hexagonal polytypes. What we now know is that these hexagonal phase impurities, they can still form on the nanoscale where they will eventually lead to performance losses and also stability issues long term. But taking the insight that, you know, macroscopically adding in these cations seem to somehow stabilize most of the perovskite, we could see, you know, well, if maybe if we can understand why the stabilization works, we can figure out where these hexagonal impurities are coming from. And nobody had come up with a coherent framework for why adding in different cations to form amodinium lead iodide helped stabilize the structure. So we decided to look at this a little bit more closely, um, particularly using a structural characterization technique called scanning electron diffraction. So in scanning electron diffraction, you can scan an electron beam across your perovskite material and get very high resolution um, crystal structure information at low doses. This is really good for perovskites because they're very beam sensitive and they'll damage very quickly under normal radiation um, conditions. And if we take some scanning electron diffraction measurements and look down you know, one of our stabilized perovskite structures and see what the local um, structure is, we see something very surprising and that's that these perovskites are non-cubic. Now, everybody assumed that they were cubic because this is the same thing that form amodinium lead iodide is, it, FAPI is cubic, but in these stabilized perovskites, these are non-cubic. And we can see this by looking carefully at the diffraction pattern. So a simulated cubic pattern should look a little bit like this one on the left does, um, but experimentally what we observe in the stabilized FAPI-like perovskites are these very subtle extra reflections showing up. And what these indicate is that we have a lower symmetry um, unit cell than a cubic one. And you know this this is a very small distortion. It's really just changing from the cubic unit cell on the top into the tetragonal one, but it's quite significant because it actually provides an energetic barrier that prevents transitioning um, between the photoactive corner sharing phase and these hexagonal undesirable phases. And so once we understood this, that adding in cations can distort the structure a little bit, we kind of had a rational explanation for why. Um, we would sometimes see these very small local hexagonal regions forming. It's essentially because distributing these cations evenly across very you know, large films relative to the atomic scale is very, very difficult. So you're always going to have some heterogeneity in that composition. And if we look at compositional measurements, we saw um, variations in the cation content that corresponded to the very same length scales that we would see um, these hexagonal domains forming in our state-of-the-art perovskites. I don't, I didn't include the compositional measurements here just for brevity, but the ultimate kind of test of this hypothesis is that if all that we're doing when we add in these cations is distorting the structure a little bit, then in principle, we should also be able to distort the structure in other ways and form a distorted FAPI that is equally as resilient to degradation as many of these um, cation additive approaches are. And that's exactly what my um, colleague Satya was able to do. He was able to stabilize FAPI um, just by using a templating agent on the, on the surface of the film. He was able to grow a distorted FAPI without any cationic additives. And this turned out to be really remarkably stable. So taking this you know, kind of fundamental insight into how some materials could be built, he could make a material that was stable for thousands of hours, which was really remarkable compared to the typical cubic perovskites, which can degrade after only a few minutes, um, even in air. So over on the right here, we have a diffraction pattern of a um, cubic perovskite. And this little delta peak here is um, indicative of the hexagonal phase already forming after only an hour of exposure to ambient air. By comparison, the distorted FAPI that Satya made after a thousand hours, there's no sign of this um, hexagonal, hexagonal domain forming. And this was really the, the kind of the, the end of the story in, in terms of understanding the stability, but it opened up kind of an exciting um, 
an exciting avenue forward for maybe going back to these form amidinium lead iodide perovskites and being able to incorporate them into devices by finding different types of templating agents. And so that was a whistle stop tour through some of my PhD um, research that I hope was um, relatively clear. And my key conclusions from all of it are that hexagonal phase impurities can cause performance losses in um, perovskite materials. Many of the stabilized kind of form amidinium lead iodide like perovskites that use cation additives are surprisingly non-cubic. And this insight into the non-cubic um, nature can help us design strategies for stabilizing um, fappy perovskites into the future. So thanks a lot for, inter um, for listening and thanks also to all of my collaborators and funding bodies that supported me throughout my PhD. Jim, thank you very much. Um, uh, great summary. Um, we have time for some questions. Uh, if you're online, please type them into the Q&A, um, uh, but I'll be pleased to pick questions up within the hall. Well, everyone's thinking, well, maybe I'll... Oh, uh, John, yes. I, I have a, a question, Tenon. Um, the grain size of these materials is very, very fine. Um, is there any attempt to... Um, increase the grain size to try to get closer to a single crystal performance and avoid the grain boundaries to avoid the heterogeneities there? Yes, pe people have looked at increasing grain size before and they've had um, mixed effects. Um, it seems that sometimes the grain boundaries and the larger grains can be more problematic. There's also traditionally been a, a difficulty in defining what grain sizes are in the field because oftentimes the morphological grains that people would look at with SEM are actually made up of much smaller crystallites. Um, but it is, it is an active area of research still. Thank you. We have another question. Hey, yeah, uh, Andrew Dames. Um, could you repeat what your your, your colleague did to do the morphological stabilization and possibly comment, is it applicable to large scale devices? So in, he used a, um, a molecular additive that only sat on the surface of the perovskite and somehow was able to direct the, um, the growth of a distorted structure, which is something that we don't fully understand yet, but are still working on. The key difference between that and the cation additives that I talked about is that the cations actually directly incorporate into the perovskite structure, so they can modify some of the optoelectronic properties as well. Um, it does seem that it's quite applicable to, you know, large-scale manufacturing, and I think that there's quite a few other templating agents that will be able to investigate and can optimize for device performance. So these sort of stories about the perovskites are, um, they're so strange for those of us brought up in, in the world of silicon, where the only silicon is a perfect single crystal with extraordinarily low levels of chemical impurities. We're now confronted with these um, uh, things cheerfully called perovskites, which are a complete mess um, and where you can sort of do almost anything to them and they still work and sometimes they work better. It, it sort of completely turns over the uh, received wisdom as to what you had to do with a semiconductor. So these sort of stories about investigating the, uh, the, the heterogeneity um, in spite of which they work are, are fascinating. Thank you, Tin. Um, I think we should, well, let's th th thank our student speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you.